so you're ready to start your journey to learn echocardiography. This demo. was really good. So you're ready to start your journey to learn echocardiography. A wise decision. It will definitely open up new avenues in your career, will make you a better doctor, ultimately for the sake of your patients. Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Thomas. Are you ready to go? More than ready. Okay, so are we. But before we start, I just want to make sure that you belong to the target audience for this course. So are you either a primary care physician or a critical care physician, an intensivist, an anesthesiologist, cardiologist, or an internist? Then this course is for you because we want to provide a course which forms the basis for all these specialities. Good. So what can you expect? The course is going to be structured the following way. We will have a starter kit course, that is where you're in right now. Then you will be able to visit our classroom or call it our basic course on echocardiography, which also includes an imaging primer and all the clinical information you will need. We will start with the starter kit right now and we will focus on the first part, which deals with left ventricular function. What you will get in your inbox a little bit later will be a chapter on aortic stenosis and then finally on mitral regurgitation. Okay, I think that's it. I think we don't want to lose any more time. We want to jump right into the topic. Left ventricular function. Is it really important? Let's hear what some experts say. I deal a lot with oncology patients and left ventricular function is really one of the most important determinants. In patients undergoing chemotherapy, you need ejection fraction before and after the chemotherapy. Left ventricular function is essential in critical care scenarios, and it allows us to look for the etiology of shock. This could be hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, or obstructive shock. Knowing the left ventricular function can also guide resuscitation and fluid administration. The left ventricular function uh, determination uh, is one most important thing in our post-surgical patient. So to summarize, why do you want to know about left ventricular function? Well, it helps to define the cause of the problem, it tells you which level of care you must provide, it dictates management and defines prognosis. And actually this is true everywhere, both in case your patient has a heart problem or in case your patient may develop a heart problem. And the nice thing is, it's rather easy with echocardiography. Anybody can do it. It's a lot easier than, for example, placing a central line. And honestly, it gives you much more information. Let's hear what Bruno says. My statement is this one. I don't need any pulmonary artery catheter. I need only the transesophageal probe. I hope we convinced you, but before we assess left ventricular function, we have to know how to image the heart. So Anna, imagine you rush to a patient to find out how his left ventricular function is to save his life. How would you go about? Well, Thomas, I would be really quick, easy, put the gel on my transducer, ask my patient to turn on his left, then I will place a transducer on the chest, left part, and I would have a direct image of the left ventricle. Uh, this is beautiful. Can you just explain us what we see here? Yes, Thomas, this is a parasternal approach in the short axis view. So actually we really see the ventricle in its round shape and the other structure is a right ventricle, which has a crescent shape. Okay, but we have to do this in slow motion because you have to understand how we get this view. So Anna, can you just rewind and show us how you put the transducer and of how to image? Of course. So we usually have enough time to place our patient in the right position, use enough gel, it's the key to get a good image, and 
the transducer for a parasternal approach has to be placed near the sternal left part of the chest and the transducer as a marker. This marker should point to the left shoulder on, of our patient. The position is around the second, third intercostal space. And here we are, we play a little bit, we have our image. So I actually prefer the short axis view if you really want to get a quick impression of how ventricle function is. Of course, there are many more views, but we'll show you these later. So congratulations, your first view. But to give the short axis view a little bit more depth, we want to provide you with a short simulation so that you better understand the anatomy and the cut plane. Here are a few very important tricks that will help you to optimize the image so that you get a very good short axis view. Now, in this case, we have a short axis view, but it's not really in the middle of the sector. How do you get it into the middle of the sector? Well, by performing kind of a rocking motion. So you move the transducer more towards the, I would say, to the right shoulder in this case, and optimizing the image so that you have it right in the middle of the screen, okay? And then when you have it in the middle of the screen, you would optimize the rotation. See what happens if I rotate counterclockwise. All of a sudden, I would leave the round shape and come into what will then be a peristernal long axis view. So try to optimize the view so you have the ventricle as round as possible. And the next thing you have to correct is the level where you cut through the left ventricle. This is optimal, but if you are too far low, you will have a view which is something like this, in other words, oval, and this is not the correct position, at least not if you want to measure. So we've cut the ventricle through its middle portion. It depends on you being more cranial or caudal with your probe, you will get the first or the second image respectively. And remember, it's extremely important not to over-rotate or under-rotate the probe, otherwise you will get this image on the left or this other image. And what you want to have is this image. And don't put your transducer too far caudal, otherwise you will get an image that looks like this, where the ventricle is not truly round but oval and where you have no right ventricle visible here. This image here is much better. Here we are at the optimal position. The ventricle is round and we do see lots of the right ventricle which surrounds the left ventricle. We will now show you how to quantify left ventricular function just by looking at it, eyeballing. But to correctly assess left ventricular function, you have to know a few little tricks. And we'll show you what you should look for. First of all, you need to look at the inward motion of the ventricle in all sides, basically. The next thing you look at is you look at the thickening of the myocardium. Notice that the myocardium gets thicker while it contracts. These two things are the principal criteria that you should be looking for in a short axis view. So this is a normal ventricle. Thomas, I don't think so. Why? I mean, function is normal, isn't it? Yeah, but I see a little structure moving. Ah, Anna, yes, you're completely right here. Right in here is a little structure that is moving quite quickly. So what do you think this is? I guess it's a vegetation. Yes, that could be a vegetation. In any case, you've seen your very first pathology. But now we need to show you how an abnormal left ventricle looks like. So, for instance, the image on the left of the screen represents a dysfunctioning left ventricle, and for sake of comparison, on the right side, you will see a normal left ventricle. Yeah, one can nicely see that the motion of the ventricle, inward motion, is a lot less compared to the motion you have here. I think it's quite apparent, right? Yes, it is. On the left, we can also see a flattening of the interventricular septum, but this is something that will come later. Yes, another pathology and your first poor left ventricular function. You know, in the world of cardiology, there are long discussions whether or not eyeballing of left ventricular function is easy or not and can be done. I think it is. It's very easy. Now, after only seeing one ventricle, I'm sure you can detect which of these four ventricles has poor left ventricular function. Exactly. Take your time. It will be easy. 
And remember, look at the inward motion of the myocardium and how it really thickens during systole. The cut from this ventricle is more or less the same in the four views. Okay, so I'm sure you've made your choice by now. This one is the ventricle which has poor fun function. It's from a young patient who was first diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy. This is definitely poor left ventricular function, and all the other three ventricles are completely normal. There are a lot of things you can see in a parsternal short axis view, and now we want to show you a few examples. We don't want you to make the diagnosis right now. This will be part of the full basic echo course. Now we want to show you how differently the left ventricle look like in pathologies. So here, for instance, is an abnormal left ventricle, relatively small in comparison to the right one, but the most amazing thing in this image is this extra cardiac mass that we recognized right there. And in these other examples, left ventricular function is still okay, but look how small is the cavity. This is due to the presence, this time, of an intracardiac mass. Look now at this ventricle, still a relatively good function, but we have another problem here. Here is the thickness of the myocardium, which is increased. We have a case of left ventricular hypertrophy. And to end, this is definitely not a good heart. We have a relatively small left ventricle in comparison to a huge right ventricle. This, you will see, it's a really clear case of pulmonary hypertension. So lots of pathologies. But when it comes to left ventricular function, you should not only rely on one view. You need to see more. And to show you more, we need to go back to the scanner. So the four-chamber view is probably the most important view in echocardiography. It gives us so much information. Anna, show us how to get such a four-chamber view. Yes, Thomas. So my patient is almost lying on my back. I ask her just to turn a bit on her left, and I put a transducer here on the fourth, fifth intercostal space. Again, the marker is pointing really lateral and really easy, a nice four-chamber view apical approach comes. You see, this is a very nice four-chamber view, even though it's not easy to really image her. She's very slim, and often it is difficult to get a four-chamber view or to get apical views in general if patients are very slim. Why is it called a four-chamber view? Well, because you see four chambers. We have the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and both atria visible. You also have the valves, but that will come later. But not always do, get, do you get such perfect images. What can also go wrong, Anna? Yes, Thomas, the most common thing is to have not a good picture of the heart and to shorten the ventricle. This is called foreshortening, and actually it's uh, due to the movement of the probe more cranially. The only thing you need to do is, again, move it caudally to get a better view. Mm. Uh, this is an important uh, thing because uh, if you foreshorten the ventricle, you don't see all the apical segments. This might be a problem in some patients, but in general, if you want to look at global left ventricle function, it's sufficient even if you only have a foreshortened chamber view. It's always nice to have an anatomic correlation, so we need to go back to the simulator once more. To review the anatomy, remember, we are imaging from the tip of the heart, so this must also be the apex of the ventricle right here. We're cutting through the apex. And this here would be the left ventricle with the interventricular septum. Here we have the right ventricle with the free right ventricular wall, the left atrium, the right atrium, and the interatrial septum. Of course, there are many more structures that we can explain to you, but we'll do that in a later chapter in our main course. And how do we assess left ventricular function in a four-chamber view? Is it different than in a parsternal short axis view? Well, yes and no. We also look at the thickening of the myocardium, and we also look at the inward motion. In other words, how the septum and the other parts of the ventricle move inward. But in addition to that, we would be looking also at the 
plane of the mitral valve annulus. If you look exactly, you can see that there's a motion of this annular plane towards the apex. This is what we call longitudinal function. So all these factors must be considered when you want to globally assess left ventricular function. And here is an example of left ventricular function assessment in four chamber view. We have a normal left ventricle on the left of the screen and a compromised function in the left ventricle on the right of our screen. But as you can see, the problem is not only the function of these two ventricles, it's also the size because we have a normal on the left and an enlarged left ventricle on the right. And another thing is different. If you look exactly at the shape of the ventricle, here this has more, a, I would say, the shape of a bullet, while here the ventricle is elliptical. Especially here at the apex, it's rounded. And this is an important feature that distinguishes a normal from a diseased ventricle as well. Beyond doubt, the four-chamber view is the most important view. It's like the high stand. From there, you can see everything that is in your field of view, and you can see a lot of things in the four-chamber view. Here is an example of a ventricle which has a problem. Anna, can you tell us what's wrong here? Yes, Thomas, definitely left ventricular function is not okay, but when you do not focus on the global function, but you go into details, we can really see a part of the left ventricle is not uh, moving correctly, it has no thickening, no in-wall motion, it's the apex, so this will be an anterior myocardial infection. And here is another example. Look at the motion of the interventricular septum, actually doesn't correlate to the motion of the remaining ventricle. This is a clear example of left bandle branch block. And here we have an example that we really always like to show because these patients have terribly good quality. And we have a case of infiltrative heart disease, in particular amyloidosis. So you really see the thickness of the myocardium, especially in the septum. Doesn't this show how beautiful the image quality can be in patients uh, who have amyloidosis. As a matter of fact, if you buy a textbook, the chances are very high that the cover picture will be amyloidosis, simply because that's the best image quality you can get if you have amyloidosis. The images are sometimes absolutely stunning. Exactly. And here we go with the last example. You already have seen the personal short axis view of this heart. Here is the four chamber view. Again, we have a huge right ventricle, which in comparison to the left ventricle is really enormous. This is the case of pulmonary hypertension we were talking about before. Thank you, Anna. We could go on and on and on showing you pathologies, but we need to move on to the next view, which is the subcoastal view. And here is the last view we want to show you. It's extremely important, especially when you work in emergency settings. It's a subcostal view. Thomas, can you tell us why it's so important? Well, the reason is that you do not need to position the patient. He can be lying on his back, and that's what you will see in emergency settings very frequently. Now, to understand how the subcostal view works, we have to know what subcostal means. It means below the diaphragm, where we'll be imaging the heart, which lies relatively far away here in the left part of the chest. So we'll be placing that transducer right underneath the sternum with the marker that you see here to the lateral side, imaging towards the shoulder. Now to image, we have to use a lot of gel. Let me put this here. And we ask the patient to inhale while I push the transducer towards his uh, sternum. So inhale. See, and then you see the heart appear. You see the four chambers. Anna, can you show what we see? Well, we can really see the left ventricle and the right ventricle. You will learn to assess also right ventricular function, but this will come later. Now focus on the left ventricle. Yes, that's important. And since this chapter is on left ventricle function, this is one of the views that I would recommend you to use. Now, in a clinical situation, you will often not be able to get views from all of the windows we showed you. But at least one of the views, I'm sure, will be able to give you information about the function. And this is actually what you need. Enough to help the patient. 
the subcoastal view. We are imaging actually through the liver. So this is the liver. This is the diaphragm. And here we have the heart. The septum is very slanted here. This is the free left ventricular wall, the free right ventricular wall. And here are both atria and the interatrial septum can be seen here. So this is how we cut the heart from a subcostal approach. This is nothing really different from an apical fold chamber view. It's only that we are imaging more medially and from below, of course. And this is also the reason why the septum is more slanted towards this direction. Yes, that's completely true. And if you look at the different subcoastal views that we can get, you will see that the orientation of the apex and septum varies a little bit depending also on the habitus of the patient. Here's a beautiful example of a normal subcoastal view. And here is an example of a patient who has a problem. What is the problem here, Anna? Yeah, actually we cannot really visualize the apex, which uh, is really important when we want to assess left ventricular function because mainly he has, you know, there's a stomach here, so he has gas and we cannot really see. Right, the apex is not good to see, but still, I guess those segments that you see can be judged and function is probably normal here. So remember the position of the septum varies from patient to patient. You would have a septum which is more parallel to the ultrasound beam in very slim patients, and you would have a position which is perpendicular to the ultrasound beam in patients who are obese. And of course, we can assess left ventricular function and subcoastal view as well. That's what you have to do if you have no other field of view available. An example of a patient with a colon carcinoma, chemotherapy, who came in in acute dyspnea. What is his left ventricular function? Extremely reduced. As we can see also, the subcoastal approach gives us the possibility to assess it. Yes, he uh, has a rather high heart rate. And the ventricle is relatively small, but nevertheless, function is definitely reduced and certainly explains its dyspnea. Now, if you don't mind, Thomas, I would like to show more examples of subcostal view and heart. Here is a classical example of pericardial effusion, and you can see the uh, pericardial effusion is creating problems to the heart. You can really appreciate the awkward motion of the wall of the right atrium. But we will go into detail later with the pericardial effusion. Now this is a matter of fact, pericardial effusion is a pathology that we really love to look at in the subcoastal view. So this is one of the big strengths of the subcoastal view. Exactly, and here we have another example. We can hardly see the movement of the right ventricle here, and the reason is really clear, there's a mass intracardiac mass involving the wall. Yeah, and this is most likely the reason the patient has a pericardial effusion, a uh, malignant cause. Exactly, and to go on with another example, this is a really good one with a huge left atrium, and actually this is a case of chronic mitral regurgitation, which of course caused enlargement of the left atrium. Yeah, this was actually a patient who refused surgery for many, many, many years. And um, despite the fact that he had very severe mitral regurgitation. And over the years, he developed a left atrium that was huge, probably one of the largest left atriums I've ever seen. Nevertheless, you can see that the subcoastal view is very powerful and you can detect a lot of pathologies from there as well. So this concludes the first part of our Echo Starter Kit. I hope you enjoyed the first part of your journey. And I'm sure you will follow us again in the second part of our starter kit because we will talk about aortic stenosis and you don't want to miss this chapter.